Brought to you by Moonbeam Multimedia. This is 16 to 1, a podcast about education, teaching, and learning. back from vacation oh we're back great it was so good this is a good episode to do because we're in that vacation state of mind and this is our second year in review year in review volume two yes for some reason we only started last year in june this new tradition (laughs) a very good time for a review of a year (laughs) so we're gonna talk to you about some of our favorite things that we learned this year and it's gonna be a bit all over the place because there's yeah. no looking rhyme at or your reason. list and looking at my list, <laughs> our lists are different, but we that's are what's interesting. Of two very different brains. Yeah, but that's that's what's cool about it. Yeah. Before we get to that part of the show, we have a couple of announcements. You may have noticed that we now introduce our episodes with "Brought to You by Moonbeam Multimedia." That's mm-hmm. Kate's voice that you can hear at the top of the show. Mm-hmm. We never formally introduced ourselves, but that's us. <laughs> We're still independently owned and operated. We just made it. A little more official, mm-hmm. and uh, that that's our company. So, our mission, I'll just read it off of our documents, because why not, to be really <laughs> official. Our mission. We, we took the time, Chelsea took the time to write this, so she will read it to you. <laughs> Listen. You did great. The, the fun and easy part of creating a business is is doing this part of the document. Mm-hmm. The, the hard part is actually running the business. But anyway... Moonbeam's mission is to craft quality digital media productions that educate, delight, and inspire. And we also are interested in convening a global community of individuals and organizations deeply engaged in the questions of how we should learn and live together in an increasingly connected world. So, 16 to 1 might soon be joined by another project or two under the Moonbeam umbrella. We don't have a lot of details about it yet, but just wanted to make you aware. You also may notice us continue to experiment with format or length or strange surprises or guests. We might have some more guest episodes in the future. There's also a possibility that you might hear from sponsors or supporters, depending on how those kinds of conversations go on the business end. This has been a labor of love of ours for however long now, since 2020. And because we want to keep bringing you episodes, we might be exploring different options to make sure the show and related projects that we're trying to get off the ground, we want to make sure that those things are sustainable over Mm -hmm. time. So we might start to offer more or different ways of engaging with our programming. We're just having a lot of fun doing this and we appreciate your understanding. We're navigating these changes and taking our work to the next professional level. So thanks for sticking around with us through it. Some growing pains. Yeah, thanks for your patience as we explore. One thing I do want to say, sign up for our email newsletter. I've been saying this the last couple episodes. It hasn't launched just yet. We're collecting emails for it, but this is where you're going to be able to stay up to date on all of our news and announcements. Internally, we're going to be Also using that list to hear from you eventually, from our community and our listeners, about how we can provide you the most valuable conversations and information that that you want. Mm. So those are just housekeeping notes. You might notice some some changes under construction, growing pains (laughs) as we -hmm. we evolve. So thanks for being here. Mm -hmm. And thanks for joining us for our year in review. Let's do our education headline roundup. You ready? Ready. Number one. The Supreme Court is expected to issue a ruling on Biden's student debt relief plan before the end of the month. Yeah. As of the time of this recording, we're still waiting to hear. But tens of millions of Americans will be impacted by the ruling, 14 million of which would emerge debt-free under the plan. Uh, At issue in the ruling is the legality of the plan itself, which relies on executive action rather than legislation, to alter the parameters of the federal student loan system during a time like a national emergency. Yeah, this was basically presidential power used during COVID times to provide relief to Mm -hmm. student loan holders in America. Yep. So we're waiting to see. Basically, that was challenged in court, and we're kind of waiting to see whether it all shakes out. So we're just in a weird holding pattern about that. And a lot of our friends are holding their breath Mm -hmm. to see what happens. For sure. (laughs) So, okay. 
Headline number two. On June 15th, the College Board, publishers of advanced placement courses, uh, they're widely taught in schools in the U.S., Canada, and more than 100 countries worldwide. I didn't realize that. I didn't either. I saw it on their website. They announced in a letter to educators that they would not alter any of their existing AP courses in response to state laws, much like those that have been proposed here in Ohio, (laughs) banning or restricting content deemed off limits or sensitive or spooky or whatever it is that is i don't know what exactly (laughs) it is about this content that is making people ban it but anyway the college board said that they're not going to change their existing ap courses in response to this kind of legislation i'm fine with that they didn't say whether or not they would change future ap coursework in response to these but they did say they won't change existing content so Um. anyway uh, I just thought that I think that's probably as much as they can say at yes. any moment. So walking, I think I'm okay they're with They're doing that a statement. delicate dance. I'll just read their quote. Quote, participation in AP courses is and always has been a choice. Families can review AP course content and make informed decisions about whether they want their students to participate. Millions of students and their families have chosen AP courses for their high standards and college level content. We respect students' ability to learn college-level material, and we respect the right of families to decide what they want their students Hmm. to learn. At stake is denying the choices of those families. I'm fine with that. End quote. That feels okay to me. Because those are the choices of their families. (sighs) Yeah, I think it's a little bit sad that the College Board is in this position. I understand why it's happening in reaction to the political environment that we have in education nowadays. I think it's good that they're not bending to too much pressure here. And yeah. I'm interested to see where this goes because it's going to continue to be mm-hmm. a louder and louder problem. I think. I think that's as good as they could have done it, honestly. Even before it became a point of the media to be questioning what is happening in a classroom constantly, like there were still people opting their kids out of certain learning opportunities mm-hmm. anyways. So mm-hmm. I think that's always going to be a factor regardless. This is not a new thing. It's just happening no it's just like popular right now like it's like the cool thing to do but okay the last one from the uk beginning in january 2024 international students seeking to study in britain will be banned from bringing family members with them to the country unless they're taking postgraduate research courses the policy change is intended to curb migration to the country which has been hitting record highs in the slackening of covid19 travel restrictions and due to world events such as the russian invasion of ukraine This is another hot button immigration Mm -hmm. issue for them. I don't understand UK politics well enough to know what's going on. I don't either. Uh, I'm not going to comment too extensively, but I do know that there's much as there is in this country, a complicated conversation about immigration. Always. And always complicated conversation. Always (laughs) complicated. Like we mentioned, this is a sort of a more casual welcome to summer episode because most of our listeners are just now getting into their summer summer vacation months. We're just going to take this opportunity to do a bit of a retrospective on the year and talk about some of the our favorite little tidbits that we have learned or what we've been working mm-hmm. on or researching. Would you like to go first? Sure. You want me to? Sure. Oh, I'm excited. I'll put you on the spot. Go I for really, it, though. I got excited. Let's start with just kind of reflecting on my school year. One thing that I focused on this past year, which was year 10, finally. One thing that I really focused on was at the beginning of a unit, looking at the rubrics for the things I was assigning to make sure that they were accurately assessing what I wanted them to. Mm, Interesting. And I think I've talked about this before, but writing rubrics is so hard. It is the hardest thing. I would also think that keeping them up to date with the way your thinking evolves yes. year after year yes. when you teach a unit would be yes. hard. Because you so, teach a unit and then your whole brain changes the way, you know, yeah, based so on what like, your students do. Sorry. Go ahead. No, you're fine. But every unit gets a binder, right? The first thing that I open is a sticky note of all the things I want to change for the next year. So I keep a running That's list pretty smart. as I do a unit to remind myself, this is bad. This is also bad please advise and so i like leave my my future self notes to be like this went really poorly katie please help yourself and so this year one of my big points of effort was to make sure that the rubrics were doing what i wanted them to okay luckily for me my mentor teacher who i'm still gonna call my mentor teacher even though i've been teaching 10 years she is a brilliant rubric writer 
she's just brilliant anyways, but she's so good at rubrics. And so literally every time I start a rubric, I immediately share it with her and tell her to help me like wordsmith it to make it do what I want it to. Rubrics are just really hard. And rubrics are like a very divisive thing in the education community. Like there are a lot of people who like do not like rubrics and do not think that they should be used. And I am mostly fine with them, but I think I'm, I think I like them as well as I do because of how I've written them. So that was kind of one of my focuses for the year was to make sure that the rubrics were doing what I wanted them to. And because a lot of rubrics came from a combination of rubrics that I kind of like spliced together. And sometimes that did or didn't work. So cool. That probably also helps your students navigate your course in the in the best way. Sets them up for success mm-hmm. when you do that. Too. Yeah. So I try. But also they'll be like, oh, I didn't read it. I'm like, well, okay. <laughs> why did I spend hours on this? <laughs> or they'll ask me, like, what do I have to include? And I'll be like, did you read the rubric? No. No. Why would I do not. that? I did not look at the life-giving information you provided me. So anyways, that was one of my goals for the year. I'm sure it will continue to be a goal. We'll see. Okay. What about you? My first bit was about a couple of books. And one of them I've talked about before because I'm still reading it. I'm, I'm a person who reads multiple books at, at a time. I know that there are people who cannot do that. They have to Me. Re- you have to read start to finish one book and yes. then move on to the next. I usually have a rotation of books that I'm reading. So a couple of books. I'm researching for another project. The first one's called The Information by author James Gleek. Traces the history of information theory and its impact on humans. Gleek sort of starts by examining the early development of writing and language and how these technologies allow humans to store and transmit information more effectively. And then he also talks about big tech advances and developments like the telegraph and telephone and computer. And it gets really technical at some points. I was listening to it in an audiobook on this big long drive that we did for for our vacation. And he just starts talking in equations at various points to represent you know, quantum mechanical things. Anyway, it can be really very dense. casual. It can reading, be very listening. dense. Yeah, but it's not so complicated that a layman can't appreciate it because I am by no means well versed in these things. But there, there is some mathy math in there. There are a lot of ones and zeros because he talks about binary a lot. I, I am not the target audience. <laughs> I am not the lame, the lay woman. If for you're that. if you're into technology or the history of technology. <laughs> It is super interesting stuff. So that's called The Information. And I I learned a lot about modern communication networks, this phenomenon called information flood, which is basically just the overload of information that might be familiar to us even being on, you know, like social media. It's basically being receiving so much information that you can't filter out the sort of signal to noise. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that was one of my favorite reads from the past year. And then the other one is one I've mentioned before. It's called The Idea Factory. It tells the story of Bell Labs, which is the research arm of AT&T, and its role in the development of some of the most important technologies of the 20th century. There's a little bit of overlap between this book and the information, but that's just my scholarly focus right now. But this book focuses on the lives and work of a group of smart and eccentric scientists, engineers, and mathematicians who worked at Bell Labs. That includes Marvin Kelly, Bill Shockley, John Pierce, Bill Baker, and Claude Shannon, who is rapidly becoming one of my nerdy interests. He's the father of information theory. So Shannon also featured prominently in the information. Just really interesting stuff that I'm swimming in. Hmm. Back to you. This is kind of a weird one. So you know how airports have codes Mm -hmm. like for it's like a shortened version or you know some kind of thing that's supposed to tell you about where you're going right and so sometimes those codes make sense right like denver's international airport is just d-e-n sometimes like orlando is mco or columbus which is cmh Uh uh-huh okay and so Columbus's international airport is actually called John Glenn International Airport. Yeah. So it being called CMH is like kind of weird, right? And MCO being Orlando's is kind of weird. Well, it's because in the case of Columbus, it was an originally called the Columbus Municipal Hangar. And that was the name of the airport. Hmm. And that's why we were CMH. Orlando, their MCO, and it came from the former title, which was McCoy Air Force Base. So anyways, I was mostly wondering because there was a tweet that went viral talking about how goofy some of 
the initials are mm-hmm. for airports. Because you, you would think that in the ease of the world, right, it would somehow relate to the place you're going. Uh-huh. It would make sense, right? Columbus just never made sense to me, mm-hmm. and I didn't understand why, and it's mm-hmm. because I was... I wasn't around when it was actually called the Columbus Municipal Hangar. So it's kind of cool that there's um, some history embedded in them. Yeah. And so I thought that was really interesting. Or you would think if they changed their name that they would want to (laughs) update that. You know why they don't? Well, it's probably because it's an ancient art. It's an ancient art. (laughs) Flying is an ancient art of just ancient alchemical. Papers and pencils. Yeah. It's just like. (laughs) Yeah. It's because of all the maps. Yeah. And I get that. Yeah. But it, it seems like at some point it would be easier to make Columbus CBS or something like that. Mm, like just so mm-hmm. that it was, you know, whatever. I got you. So while it seems like CMH doesn't make any sense, it's because it doesn't to us now. Cause it's no longer called that, but um, they're usually always named for what they once were. And then they changed their title to be more representative of the area that they serve. Fun airline facts. Yeah. It was just kind of a learning to fly episode from, from a couple weeks ago. So while it seems goofy, it seems that most of them have a good reason, but some of them are just much nicer than others, you know. You would like Boston as BOS. Like, that's nice, you know. <laughs> You're for a more representative I am because I think... Acronym. I, well, I'm mostly thinking about people who are not from here traveling. I would hope that it, their lives are easier uh-huh. if, the, if the codes are more representative of the place that they're going, is all. Uh-huh. But anyways, it was interesting to learn about what some of them have as their code. And why? Cool. All right, what else you got? Up next, I learned a lot about local government, zoning. You have <laughs> municipal planning, strategic vision, population <laughs> growth, etc. I was on, still am on, this 10-year comprehensive plan committee for my town. And it sounds very official, but it really, it was more just a, a volunteer-led process of people who are part of the community getting together to try to draft a document that discerns the future of our town, mm-hmm. um, especially in light of the fact that Intel is building a huge chip manufacturing facility and just now, down the road from us. Well, also, we just saw well, there's more data coming oh, into the yeah, area. Oh, yeah. I think, was it Microsoft is Microsoft. building a data center? We have a lot of data centers around here. I don't know why that is, but they're just, you can see them when you drive. Mm -hmm. When you drive by, they're just these huge windowless buildings that just look like something out of a sci-fi novel. They're just kind of creepy, big, giant buildings. But our Um, little, our little village, like Chelsea said, we're kind of anticipating these companies coming in and what that'll be like. Yeah. In the face of the fact that Intel is coming and building this huge facility, our population in the surrounding area is going to probably jump a lot um Mm -hmm. with that comes housing crunches which we're already in one it's Mm -hmm. difficult to find affordable housing around here we're gonna have to talk about you know utilities and Mm -hmm. facilities like public parks and all kinds of like transportation models and like i said more than i ever wanted to know about zoning Mm -hmm. and sewer and water and floodplains and i just can't recommend it highly enough to participate in something like this because it will open your eyes to so many problems that you never Mm -hmm. knew people had to think about on a daily basis so i'm a big proponent of participating in local government however you choose to or can this is just one opportunity that i had that i took that was really really interesting i i mostly did it because i wanted to learn about my town and its history and its people and where we're going its education systems all of these things are part of this conversation Mm -hmm. and the whole purpose of it was just to create a playbook a guideline for the town to use as it navigates the next decade of growth and change Mm -hmm. so that was a really interesting process, and I learned so much. Mm-hmm. Back okay. to you. My, I'm going to kind of like combine my next two. Okay. Because they're both baseball adjacent. Okay. So one is that uh, one of my coworkers sent me a link to a Twitter account called Historic Vids. Or I'll put the link in the show notes. But this technology is being used to show basically a video version of what it looked like when Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig took batting practice. Huh. And so the technology of the images and the slowed down version, which they were able to put together to create their swings and stuff like that, 
it's so cool to see these swings. It was just really cool technology that they used to kind of fill in the gaps of what it looked like. I love baseball, so it's it's fun to see like two of the greats, right? Maybe the best ever in Babe Ruth swing and to compare it to what we now value as the most beautiful swing. King Griffey Jr. is like known to have the most beautiful swing in baseball. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. They literally call it like the sweetest swing. Everyone wants his swing to be the logo for MLB. I didn't so, know there was such discourse even. Oh my gosh. His swing is so what beautiful. What makes a swing beautiful? It's so smooth. It is like the most natural. Smoothness? Oh yeah. Okay. I'll show you when we're done. It yeah. is a beautiful swing. Okay. But when you compare that to like Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig, it's so different. And uh-huh. so it's really interesting to well, see. I'm sure like, the game has evolved so much in the in yeah. many years too. And like Babe Ruth didn't have a smooth swing. And it could be because the technology of this video had, mm. doesn't mm-hmm. allow it either. But it's just really cool as a baseball person to look at it and be like, oh my gosh, this guy would bat over 100 uh-huh. today. Uh-huh. Um, I'll include the link because the video is really neat of them taking batting practice. The other thing that's going on right now in Major League Baseball surrounding the Oakland A's. Have you been reading about this at all? Charles? I have not. Okay. So the Oakland A's are, I think right now, the worst team in baseball. They might not be anymore because they, they were on like a seven-game winning streak. But Oh, Recently, Las Vegas has been acquiring professional teams. Mm -hmm. So they have the Golden Knights, the NHL team, and they just won a Stanley Cup. The Oakland Raiders just moved to Las Vegas to now become the Las Vegas Raiders. Mm -hmm. And so there's also talk that the Oakland A's will move to Las Vegas to be the Las Vegas A's, right? The Athletics. Oakland is mad, rightfully so, (laughs) because they keep losing their team. Oakland is mad. There are basically two options. Either the owners sell... Or they move. Mm -hmm. And that's really all that's left. And so the Columbus crew went through this a few years ago. Yeah, people hold on to these things for decades, I will just say. Like, people will, they'll they'll be like, no, I'm an A's fan until I die. No matter where they are, I will always be an A's fan. Or they'll be like, you're dead to me. Oh, yeah. So, like, St. Louis lost their football team. Uh They're still really mad the Rams left. If you are in Cleveland and mentioned Baltimore, you'll probably be killed because that's who took the Browns the last time the Browns left before they came back. And the Browns are now a fan-owned team. Uh-huh. We almost lost the Columbus crew in the same way uh, when the yeah, guy in almost, Austin tried to buy them. To Texas. Yep. Right now, the Reds are kind of having the same moment. The Reds won't leave, but the owner is awful. Mm. So anyways, Oakland days Bummer. are going through a really bad time, basically. Okay. Everyone was like, okay, just sell the team. That's what they're all wanting them to do. So the A's fans last week did a reverse boycott and they filled the Coliseum, their stadium, with more than 27,000 fans, which is a lot for them. And they had shirts made that just said sell. (laughs) And in the fifth inning, they were completely silent for the first batter when the A's were on the field. So the, uh, the A's were like pitching and they were completely silent for the first batter. And after that play, the second batter, they started chanting sell the team so loudly that the pitcher couldn't hear his calls. So they had to pause the game to check his headset to see if his they didn't think his hat was working. The catcher had to come out. The ump had to come out. But they were chanting so loudly that they had to take time out of the game. And so, like I said, wow. the other big thing with baseball this year, if you haven't watched any, is that there's now a new pitch clock. Mm-hmm. And this pitch clock is very divisive, and it's completely changing how they're playing baseball. And I won't go into all that. But it's a big deal to have to take a break right now because you only get so many. Right. The fact that the A's did it to their own pitcher, basically. Like, mm-hmm. they're they're not mad, obviously. Mm-hmm. The A's players are, like, thrilled with this because they're kind of having a moment. So, yeah, it's just been really fun. I love watching people be excited about baseball. It seems like Oakland wants their team. And as a person from Ohio who has seen teams leave in the middle of the night like the mm-hmm. Browns or we almost lost the crew. And anyways, it's just been it's been fun to watch the A's and kind of what's happening and and I hope that they don't get I hope they don't move to Las Vegas. Get yanked out of yeah. I just really don't think Vegas is a baseball town, but Bryce Harper would disagree. That's where he's from. That's my baseball update. Okay. Thank you for the baseball mm-hmm. report. You're welcome. My next thing is about social technology. So social media, among other things, we're going through an era of rapid change and (laughs) we're getting yanked along for the ride and it's a bit rocky. So Twitter has kind of 
fallen. I mean, I'm considering it fallen, even though it still technically exists and functions. I don't spend much time there anymore, despite the fact that I used to spend way too much time there. You know, Facebook has admitted, and this has been a couple of years ago, but they've admitted that they are practically hardwired to spread misinformation and divisive content. Reddit is in the midst of a full-scale user revolt right now. They've had a whole bunch of subreddits go dark, and then they've started to take over those subreddits and kick out the moderators and switch them back to being public because they apparently don't respect their users all mm-hmm. that much. Um, it's a huge mess. That was but- a colossal... Oh, I can't imagine destroying user goodwill more rapidly than the Reddit CEO Mm -hmm. has done. But anyway, we're sort of finally realizing why we have been instinctively distrustful of these big, big social media companies and tech companies all along. I think we thought we had good ideas about how to connect to each other over the Internet. And we may have had some good ideas Mm -hmm. about that, but I think that we're realizing that we were not prepared for the scale and speed factors that came with Mm -hmm. connecting people over Mm -hmm. the internet. When information comes at us so fast and so often without establishing trust, it can break down, which is Mm -hmm. what we're just just in real time. (laughs) Yeah. So I think very, very rapidly, too. (laughs) I think the next decade or so of the internet's going to be make or break. I think we're either going to moderate our worst impulses and come up with better solutions for some of these problems that come with all of these big social media companies, or we're going to just succumb to it. The internet is either just going to become a giant billboard advertising wasteland that Mm -hmm. can't be trusted. It's just there to sell you crap, which it already kind of is. It's going to become more of the same of that, or there's going to be some sort of revolution where people realize that in order to have a reason to go online we need to protect our online spaces and you know make sure that it's still a place of learning and the people can be in communities where they're safe and respected and things like that so anyway i think our education system is going to play a major role in this evolution one way or another and i'm just not sure which direction we're headed in but that's what I've learned a lot about. The, okay. the sort of collapse of the first <laughs> golden age of, of the social internet. One more thing for the bingo board. Yeah. We're going along with that. The whales are organizing. What? <laughs> the orcas. Have they you been have reading? Facebook? <laughs> no. The, oh. It's a lawless world and we should fear them. Okay. So the whales are organizing. For what? They've been... Are they coming for us? They've, yes. Oh, gosh. They're going after the yachts. Have you not read about this? Um, they have been intentionally hitting oh, the boats yeah. to uh, strand those people. I have read about this. Well, I've seen them fly out of the water from underneath. Is that what you're talking about? No. Oh, okay. No, there are groups of orcas uh-huh. who are working together yeah. to disable boats. Yeah, that's what I mean. They're fun. Oh. Like, they... they they jump up to the surface and bonk into the boats. Oh, okay. I thought you just wanted like a free willy moment. <laughs> I was like, well, yeah, whales just jump out of the water. That's like kind of their thing. No, I mean, into the boats. The whole point oh, is they're hitting okay. the boats. Well, say that. Okay, sorry. Because otherwise I'm just like, well, yeah, whales jump out of water. That's like why we, you know. Okay. Got so it. I have been for a long time anti-Sea World. And I think, sure. I think they are coming for us. And I think we deserve it. As retribution for having been kept in captivity? Yes. Okay. okay. And they're, like, they're in these little... It's awful. Anyways, the whales are organizing. There's now a group of them off of California who are gathering together. I just hope that they take them all down. So they're, you're saying they're teaching each other how to yes. attack boats? Yes. To disable them. Isn't that great? Nature is scary, man. Nature is... <laughs> it is scary. But I have no bad feelings about that. If the orcas take over, it's fine. We had it coming. <laughs> okay, so watch out for the orcas. They're coming for us. I, I think it's actually more than just orcas, but that's what I've been reading about. But I would just have a healthy fear of whales if you have a large boat. <laughs> healthy fear of whales. Okay. I also just have a health a healthy fear of whales. That's just also something oh, that I have. You've learned that over the past year that you have. Oh, I've already fear. had it. Have you oh, seen okay. those teeth? Yeah. I don't yeah. want that. I like. The it's called a killer whales. whale. Are you know, kidding me? I know. I like the baleen whales. Their teeth look like the what combs. whales? Baleen whales. What is that? Well, they're probably not ramming into boats, but baleen. That's cute. They're yeah. That is not cute. They filter. They suck oh. in water and filter through their weird little 
teeth their, comes their, their and then teeth. yeah they just, just like intentionally no get stuff stuck in their teeth oh and then eat it. those are scary no but they're the friendly ones they're just you know eating their mouths are scary they do look pretty weird okay i understand now so now you've learned about baleen whales they, these are kind of pretty I guess I have seen these, right? I didn't know that they were called that. I think I just called that a whale. I think that's like one of those animal facts that I learned in third grade or something and just never forgot. You know how in elementary school they just teach you things Ew, that they decide I are super important? I hate their mouths so much. <laughs> Ew. Okay. Okay, I'm going to not Google baleen teeth again. <laughs> Filter feeding. There you go. That's what you were talking yeah. about. Ew, they're... Oh, God, I hate it. Uh, half a million calories in a mouthful. Can you imagine? <laughs> what? That's a this lot is why of the whales are mad. Because this is all we've boiled them down to. <laughs> Their teeth type. Anyways, if you haven't been reading about the whales, it's just re it's really interesting because they're very smart. And if you've seen Finding Nemo, you know they communicate. Okay. I've I've just I've just loved watching people be like <laughs> they're gathering. <laughs> Everyone Prepare. And all the Captain Ahab jokes are coming out. It's really funny. <laughs> it's a reverse Ahab. Yeah. Okay. My next thing is a little bit of a bummer, but I have been learning about what is called in sociological circles a loneliness epidemic. I've been reading Bowling Alone, which is the sort of go to work on this topic. There's a Surgeon General's report that just came out about this recently. There are a bunch of COVID related studies. A lot of talk about social capital, which is the term kind of given to the networks of relationships among people who live and work in a particular society that enable that society to function effectively. So the various measures that we have of social capital, these indexes are indicating that we are more and more isolated and lonely than we have ever been. Uh, COVID certainly didn't help with all of that. And I think that it's going to become another major problem that we as a world need to tackle. We need to once again figure out how to live and work and talk in community in new and different ways because we're we're losing our social fabric. So that that's sort of what I started to learn about. And I'm going to keep learning about this too. Interesting. Okay. Back to you. Okay. Another animal update. If you've been listening to this pod, you know that I am obsessed with Grizzly 399. Ah, she's the matriarch of the Tetons. Yes. Our girl was spotted. Again? She made it. Through the winter. Through the cold winter. Oh. And? Yes, she has a cub. Another cub? Just one. Was it last year she had four? I think she had four Two last year. I think that was... I can't remember. I can't remember. I think remember. it was last year, maybe. So, she's been spotted. Okay. She's at least 27 years old. Oh, jeez. Wow. And that now makes her the oldest known bear to ever reproduce wasn't weren't people hunting her last year yes <laughs> people are always hunting her okay she said no she said no thank you okay the girl's at it she's been spotted in the tetons she had a good winter she's got the baby they're out and about defying all odds because everyone always you know ever since i've been following this bear which has been a couple years now Every time she goes on the hibernation, they assume. Did you start following this bear when we went to Yellowstone? Was it was one? before that. I saw it somewhere before we went. Okay. And I've just been following her for a few years, I guess. She's thriving. The next thing I learned about, and it's been talked about ad infinitum in the media, I learned a lot about generative artificial intelligence, which is... In common terms like ChatGPT mm -hmm. or Dolly or these other tools that people are using to make stuff out of data. I learned a lot about it, the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is I think that if you understand how the technology works, it might be useful for certain tasks. <laughs> sure. <laughs> That's the simplest way that I can say it. Yeah, because we've kind of talked about how to make it work for you. Yeah. In particular, I've found it useful for brainstorming and for basic computer programming assistance. It's kind of like having an online translation tool. So mm -hmm. it's for me, it's good for situations where I understand the architecture of the program I'm trying to write, but I might not know the syntax of a particular mm -hmm. language that oh, I'm sure. needing to use. So in that case, it's kind of like a universal translator for code. So that's the good part. The bad part is that it's already replacing human labor or trying to, in many cases, 
there are all these companies that are replacing services that might typically be done by humans, like copywriting and coding and image production Mm -hmm. and marketing, all these sorts of tasks. People are trying to replace it with AI-driven alternatives. So that's not great for the labor market. This isn't in every single case, but in a lot of the major models that are being used right now, they're trained on data that people didn't necessarily intend to be used in that manner. So often we get this human generated data, treasure troves of data, actually like Reddit. That was one of the Mm -hmm. reasons people think that Reddit's closing its APIs is because it wants to start charging companies to use it as training data. Hmm. So, So human generated data is used without permission a lot of times and also without compensation to the original content creators a lot of times. That that's what feeds these models. So that's not always great. It's an unreliable narrator because there's no guarantee that the information you get from these generative AI tools is truthful. Mm -hmm. There was a case a couple weeks ago of lawyers who asked ChatGPT to help them write their arguments and ChatGPT invented case law that does not in fact Mm -hmm. exist and these lawyers used it in their arguments and the judge was like, WTF, guys. So (laughs) people already don't understand the technology or how it should be used, which is kind of my next point. People know so little about how this stuff works, much in the same way that people know very little about the inner workings of things like algorithmically trending topics on mm-hmm. social media. People don't know how like ad targeting or social media or all these things work just in that same way. They don't know how these generative AI models work. When you don't know how it works, you're likely to end up on the bad side of some sort of disaster. (laughs) You might Mm -hmm. end up like those lawyers who cited non-existent case law. You might end up in a data leak or a glitch, or you might unwittingly surrender sensitive information or intellectual property. There are all kinds of fun things (laughs) that people are learning is bad. So, Mm -hmm. uh, and then the other thing is just that like having this stuff be closed source is basically asking to be annihilated by the algorithm all over again. Mm -hmm. Um, these proprietary social media algorithms, we, we know that they're designed to sow discord. And we've learned that the hard way because we didn't have eyes on those algorithms. We have the same sort of problem going on here because these models don't tell us uh, how they're working in a lot of cases. We are setting ourselves up to go down dark paths mm-hmm. again, all over again. Again, a different dark path. I'm a little worried that the internet is just going to become full of AI-generated gibberish if it isn't already there. You can already kind of tell when you read articles online whether or not they've been... You read these articles and it's just like 800 words of gobbledygook nonsense that's stuffed with keywords, and then you finally get the kind of content down below, which is just a game. Mm-hmm the search engines. So anyway, there's all kinds of just nasty stuff that's going to come out of these models if we don't get some pretty strict regulation on them. There's also a lot of fear-mongering about them, though, and I think that both sides are a little bit overblown, and the truth is probably somewhere in the middle about how dangerous these things are. But I'm not really looking forward to the new era of, is this video a real yeah <laughs> that's not gonna be fun no i'm not excited um, about that so anyway that uh, yeah i learned about ai okay. a lot i know i've talked about this before but i set a reading goal for the year a very intentional reading goal i have been for the past couple of years really trying to focus on more reading just in general i've been trying to read for fun more often And so setting this goal is something that works for me because I'm a very competitive person. So I want to do it because you're competitive. Well, and I also I don't leave tasks unfinished. So that's the other thing. This is why you can't have a book and then also another book that you're reading in the background. Got to do them all. So we've talked about Libby, the app that we use to check out audiobooks from our library. It's kind of like my little gift every month to myself as I get a new book. I'm on target. And I'm also participating in the Ohio State Alumni Association's book bingo. And it's been really fun fun. because it's been like a very intentional way for me to read things I normally wouldn't. Yeah. Because the the bingo board is like full of things I also wouldn't normally read. Yep. Having some external checklist is also, I I understand that as a great motivator. So I get that. uh, We're 
I'm on track. I'm saying we're because Chelsea listened to two books in the car with me on our drive. I'm along for the ride on your bingo board. Uh huh. So we listened to The Escape Artist, and that's the story of the man who escaped Auschwitz. I'll put these in the show notes. And then we also listened to Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow. Oh, yeah. And mm-hmm. uh, those were two of my bingo, my bingo board slots. So that was fun. Cool. The other thing that I'm always just absorbing really is, I guess, just podcasts, of course. But the one I've really been into this past year was Noble Blood. Mm, mm-hmm. And um, I really like learning about the nobles. I really like learning their histories. And I don't I don't know a lot about them. So it's been really fun to kind of focus in on something that I, that I find so fascinating. Because I think... I don't know why I feel this way. I feel like as Americans, nobles are just like so fascinating to me because we don't like have that other than just like, you know, tycoons of some sort. <laughs> My grand, great, great grandfather, the yeah. robber baron. Like I'm thinking like the Vanderbilts, right? Or like whatever. Yeah, that's, yeah. So Noble Blood is a great podcast. It's so well done. It's very digestible. I'll include a link to that as well. So I've been trying to learn more. Reading, listening, and learning. I've been trying to learn more. That's yeah. Good. If anybody has any recommendations for books or podcasts other than noble blood that are about that i would love that i would love to learn more about the wives of king henry and you know like that kind of thing like i i I would like to find something that's a little bit more of a deep dive okay so if you have any recommendations that would be great yeah my last thing was also about reading i learned how to read again and i'm saying that kind of facetiously but it's also true i sort of burnt out on reading long stuff for a while Mm -hmm. and in college I read so intensely you had to read a whole lot to keep up and for for a couple years and I don't I've never stopped reading I love reading don't Mm -hmm. get me wrong but I kind of fell out of the habit of letting myself be consumed by books and part of that's just our dwindling attention spans part of it is I wasn't sure what I wanted to read when I wasn't being told what to read. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I discovered for myself another research interest and started reading pretty broadly in these areas. And so, yeah, I I learned to read again instead of doom scrolling at night. And it's good for me. So, And I learned that my brain feels a lot better when it has that ongoing Mm -hmm. learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The last one I have is just the we've kind of started to reprioritize going to see shows and art and music and things like that. Mm -hmm. And it's been a very welcomed return for me. And I didn't realize how much I missed things live. Yeah. You know, live art. So we got to see Parade, which we talked about. The musical. musical Mm -hmm. on Broadway. We just got back from a two week trip where we got to see Joni Mitchell perform live at the Gorge. We have tickets later this summer to see Stevie Nicks and Billy Joel. If you know me personally, you know this about me too, but Chelsea affectionately calls me at a show concert Katie because that's like... She's a different person. That's like my purest form. I've like never been happier than that live it's music. Like the, it's like the last evolution of her Pokemon. It is. Concert Katie. That's like the peak. Because of our schedule and a pandemic and all kinds of things, you know, we were limited. It's just been really wonderful to get to return to these things. And I didn't realize... I, th- I knew I missed it. I just realized like how much I, I really like need that, you know, I need to see live music and I need to like be there and experience it and things like that. It's just really important to me because I think I am a different person. I think I'm a better person at a concert. (laughs) (laughs) So we, we spent two weeks driving out West. Mm -hmm. We did Seattle, Mm -hmm. which great city. Seattle is definitely in my top three of favorite cities. I am obsessed. Mm -hmm. It was so beautiful. We just had the best. It's very time. green. That's the thing that struck oh, it's me. So there's beautiful. so much green in the city. It's yeah. intentionally designed to not look like a concrete jungle, which yeah. is striking Refreshing. when you're super used to but, Columbus. <laughs> okay, that was an attack. Um, not that. No, no I, I like Columbus, but it's not green. It's not green at all. Uh, no, it's not. Driving in Seattle is, as Chelsea put it, <laughs> what did you keep saying it was? A negotiation. A negotiation with the cars around you. Oh, yes. I was calling it a negotiation because there are so many traffic circles, well, at least in the neighborhood where we were staying, which is Ballard. You can't always see the stop signs. No. And the intersections are all, there are a lot of roundabouts, but then the ones that aren't, it's sort of like, okay, who is, who's going to stop? Mm-hmm. Who's got to yield? Mm-hmm. There, it's, yeah. Every intersection is a surprise. So It's a little weird. We traveled out west. We stopped in Deadwood, South Dakota on our way out. Mm-hmm. We stopped in Bozeman, Montana, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Then we got to Seattle. It was amazing. 
And then we headed to the Gorge, which is the amphitheater in eastern Washington, where we got to see... It was the Brandy Carlisle weekend. So the first night was Marcus Mumford and Brandy Carlisle and Allison Russell. The second night was Joni Mitchell with the jam. And then Sunday night was uh, The High Women with Marin Morris and Brandy Carlisle. And we got so lucky with our neighbors who were so kind and they fed us and they were just so wonderful to us. Yeah, they us. cooked for us. They cooked hot meals for us because it was cold and rainy and we were in a tent yeah. and they were in an RV and they took pity on us. Yes. They and were they, so nice. They were just so much fun and we have not stopped talking about them since we got home. Some new favorite people. We do. So we did that and then on our way back home, oh, we stopped at Leavenworth, the Bavarian village. I forgot to mention that. <laughs> and then we came back. Leavenworth, Washington yeah. is, is a tiny little town in the mm-hmm. middle of nowhere and it's a Bavarian village. They it was just amazing. leaned into the theme. Yeah. Really hard. It was a great trip, but it really made me appreciate the chance to get to see live music and experience that with people and things like that. So just thankful that we're at a place where we can we can do that. And the other thing, and this is just kind of my little soapbox, is I really wish that there was a way to make Broadway more accessible for people. Broadway? Yeah. When you and I were there, I had kind of an interest in seeing Sweeney Todd mm-hmm. on Broadway because Jordan Fisher was in it. And the tickets were like 300 some dollars a piece. Yeah. Like we could not swing it. He he's already left the production now. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just I wish more people could experience it. Yeah, that's I'm what not I too wish about it because I think there is something special about it's being live. I think it, I think there's a real difference in yeah. sitting in the room where it happens versus watching a recording of something. I agree. So I understand why people are protective of recordings of shows and stuff like that but at the same time like you're saying the cost of seeing live theater is so prohibitively expensive for such a large portion of the population it's like could we not do more good by spreading more art to more people yeah. the answer is probably yes but yeah. how do we you know how do you make it work how do you appropriately compensate the performers in those cases it just becomes a real big mess but yeah. i but i do think that being able to share more art with more people in general is probably a good thing yeah anyways i just wish there was a, a middle ground somehow yeah. That's just my little soapbox. It's just, I wish those things were more accessible for people. Absolutely. Shall we do fill in the blank? Yes. I will read last episode's question. The first person on the ground to direct planes so they would not collide, the first air traffic controller, was hired by the city of St. Louis in 1929 to work at Lambert Field. He stood on the airfield and waved flags at planes to let pilots know when they could land, take off, and when they shouldn't. Archie W. League, a barnstorming pilot born in Poplar Bluff, Missouri in 1907, is generally acknowledged as that first controller. Archie League. Nice. This episode's question is about baseball. So it's June, which means that the College World Series for men's baseball is wrapping up shortly. This tradition of college baseball originally started in what year? So since the College World Series started, USC has won the most titles with 12, and the Texas Longhorns have made the most appearances with 38, but they've only won six of 38 appearances. Hmm. So in what year did the College Baseball World Series start? That about wraps it. That's our our year in review, volume two. Thanks for joining us. We hope you have a good summer. Do you have any final wrap-up thoughts? No, I'm just, it's, it's good to be home. And I'm excited to get back into it. I just want to tell you that you do a great job at this pod, and I appreciate all you do to make it go. Oh, thank you. So do you. I'm excited. I'm excited to see what's up. We're looking forward to it, and we'll talk to you in two weeks. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for supporting 16 to 1. We're trying to grow our audience, so please check us out at 16 to 1.com, all spelled out, and tell your friends about the show. On our website, you can find links to follow us on social media, an archive of all our old episodes, and a contact form where you can get in touch. Thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you next show. Yeah, rattlesnake preparedness is not on my my list of things I really know about. Well, the first time it happened, we pulled into like this cute little overlook. And it was like, warning, rattlesnakes, stay in your car. And I looked down and I had Birkenstocks on. I was like, absolutely not. Anyways, I I think this was the year of the animal for me. The year of the animal. And of the wienermobile, lest we forget. (laughs)